separation is not the gospel. The separation is not the Great Commission. It's not the main work of the church, but it is a wall of protection that God in, intends to be risen, to be raised up, to protect us from spiritual dangers. It's protection. Don't tell me that separation from the world in a very practical way, way down how we live, is not a doctrinal issue. It is. Doctrine means teaching as a teaching of the Word of God. All right, it's a tremendous blessing to see so many in the house of God tonight and uh, faithfulness to the church, to the right church, to be in the right church and faithfulness to that church is a very important thing in the Christian life. So we thank the Lord for each of you that are here tonight. We're preaching this week on biblical separation. I want to read the text again, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 15 through 26. It's a text that we began with in Sunday school this morning. 2 Timothy 2, verses 15 through 26. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. And as we said in Sunday school this morning and all day long, actually, great changes are happening today. I've been saved for nearly 40 years, and great changes have happened in my Christian lifetime among fundamental Baptists. And there has been a, a wholesale collapse in the belief and practice of biblical separation. It's become exceedingly rare to be able to preach this kind of thing in a fundamental Baptist church today. And, but at the same time, and so these, these, these bridges are being built from fundamental Baptist churches today out toward the, the broader evangelical world. And uh, 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 because of the breakdown of separation, at the same time, uh, the, the evangelicalism, and the evangelical denominations out there today uh, have become uh, 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 more and more apostate and farther and farther away from the Word of God. And uh, if we use the metaphor that those are waters out there in uh, contemporary Christianity, they're very treacherous today. And we could use many metaphors. We could use the metaphor of a, uh, a large, uh, pleasant land, perhaps. A lot of people believe that the broader Christianity out there, the, the evangelicalism, the more contemporary uh, approach to the churches is very appealing and very pleasant. It's like a big, pleasant land out there, and it's enticing. I want to go out there. There's more liberty out there, and there's more excitement out there, and uh, there's more broad-mindedness out there, and there's more intellectualism out there. That's very enticing, but those are very treacherous places out there. And uh, the people out there tend to carry diseases that are contagious. The treacherous waters of contemporary Christianity. I want us to just uh, uh, focus in tonight for a few minutes about how, uh, what has happened to, in Christianity in the last 20, 30, 40 years. 
New evangelicalism was a movement that started in the late 1940s and ex really exploded in the 1950s and 60s. And it was a rejection of the old uh, fundamentalism of the first half of the 20th century. And uh, uh, children had grown up in the homes of old defining fundamentalists, they called themselves, and uh, were called who had separated from uh, uh, liberalism and taken a stand against uh, 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 the old liberalism and that had permeated the denominations. Harold Ockengay claimed to have coined the term New Evangelicalism. It's not a co term that was coined by a fundamentalist or independent Baptist. But he said New Evangelicalism is different from fundamentalism in its repudiation of separatism. At the heart and soul of the New Evangelical movement was a, a rejection of biblical separation, which is our theme today. And that philosophy permeated Christianity, uh, uh, works its way throughout the denominations, the, the, the parachurch organizations that had an international influence, the Southern Baptist Convention that I grew up in, and uh, uh, swept through everything, all, almost all of the popular evangelical, well, all of them, the popular evangelical speakers today represent this, this new philosophy, and, and all of them hate biblical separation. They hate it. They haven't just rejected it, they hate it. Uh, here's, a, here's a handful, David Jeremiah, Louis Palau, James Dobson, of course, Louis Palau, his son is taking over, uh, Chuck Colson, Max Licato, Tony Campolo, Chuck Swindoll, Chuck Stanley, and a whole bunch of other Chucks we could mention. And they represent this new evangelical positive face to Christianity. Let's focus on the positive. Uh, let's don't be critical. Let's don't be divisive kind of Christianity, new evangelicalism. You go into a Christian bookstore today, uh, 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 whether it's operated by Southern Baptist, the Lifeway Christian bookstore, family Christian bookstores, whatever, and you just are confronted with all sorts of books. And all of those books represent, almost all of them, represent this philosophy of new evangelicalism and a repudiation of separatism. Let's have a big tent Christianity. And the chief error of this new evangelical philosophy, which has taken over everything in the last 50 years, is not the heresy that they preach so much as the truth that they neglect. Now, that's very important to understand because you can listen to these men on the radio or whatever, on the Internet, and you can hear some, some good preaching, teaching. They usually don't preach much, but some good Bible teaching and uh, 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 some sound things and some Bible exposition, and, and it can even be a blessing and a help to you. And some of the books in these bookstores uh, uh, are sound as far as they go, but there's so much truth that they neglect. They refuse to deal with it because it's so controversial, and it would so much narrow their ministries down. Uh, uh, only the Lord knows men's hearts and motives, but we know that preaching the kind of things that we preach here in this church uh, will not get you a very broad tent today and a, uh, a crowd. But they avoid things like ecclesiastical separation and a fiery hell usually, a separation from the world as far as a clear teaching about that, end time apostasy and such things. And it's a, a soft, non-offensive type of Christianity. Charles Woodbridge, back in 1969, wrote a good book about that. And it was called The New Evangelicalism. But he identified the fact that it's a slippery slope. And he said, the New Evangelicalism advocates toleration of error. Toleration, that's where it starts. Well, I'm not a charismatic, but I'm not going to fight against them. I'm not this, but I'm not going to you know, uh, 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 go on a campaign against them. Toleration. It is following the downward path of accommodation to error, cooperation with error, contamination by error, and capitulation to error. A downward slope of compromise. And as a result of the broke, breaking down of the walls of separation in evangelicalism today, and uh, uh, many independent Baptists today who are going in that direction, they have been inundated with uh, uh, these incredible heresies, both ancient and end-time heresies and, and uh, fables. Second Timothy 
Chapter 4, verses 3 and 4 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And we're going to look at some of those tonight. You walk into a Christian bookstore, for example, and you walk over to the Bible version section, and you find the smorgasbord approach to Bible versions today that take your pick, whatever suits your fancy approach over there. And the, uh, uh, the, 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 you're not warned about the great error of the modern Bible versions. The fact, number one, that they're based upon a corrupt Greek text, and uh, therefore they're textually corrupt, and, uh, 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 and that, uh, that the New Testament is a lot shorter uh, uh, than the uh, old Protestant Bibles like the King James Bible. Thousands of words omitted the equivalent of uh, First and Second Peter being taken out of the Bible. But there's doctrinal issues there in those textual corruptions. A weakening, for example, of the doctrine of the deity of Christ. One of the first verses I look at to check out a textual basis of a Bible is 1 Timothy 3. 16, where the word God is in the King James Bible, but is omitted in all of the modern versions. We've documented this, but the, the modern versions also use a corrupt principle of translation called dynamic equivalency that allows the, 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 the translator to have these incredible, incredible liberties with the word of God. And, and, and even uh, 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 ending up with something like this, the message, which is very popular, and it's in the Southern Baptist bookstores. I was at a Southeastern Baptist seminary on this trip, Wake Forest, uh, North Carolina, and uh, went into the bookstore, and they were selling this. King James Bible, for example, in Matthew and the Sermon on the Mount says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now the message says, you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there's more of God and his rule. I hope you're saying, what? <laughs> where, did he, where did he get that? From his vain imagination and his communication with fables. That's where he got it. But this modern Bible version smorgasbord, smorgasbord philosophy is a very slippery slope. Many times the church will say, well, let's just use the new King James. And it's just got some updated language and whatnot. Let's just go there. We're not going to go wild on modern versions or anything, but let's just do that, and we'll help the people understand it better. And, uh, but it's a slippery slope, that whole philosophy, and pretty soon uh, you just don't care anything about any translation at all, and you're using something like the message. That's a fact. You say, who in the world would use the message? Just about everybody. Here are, pe here are the, just a few names of those that have recommended it. Rick Warren, Billy Graham, Warren Wiersbe, J.I. Packer, Johnny Erickson Tata, and by the way, that is Warren Wiersbe, Pastor. Uh, Bill Hybels, Bill Gaither, Chuck Swindoll, Joyce Meyer, John Maxwell, Max Lucado, and many others. How can they possibly recommend such a wretched thing, which is not the Word of God, it's not even a paraphrase. It's just a novel that somebody made up. Because of that spiritual blindness that's there, my friends, and the multiplicity of versions destroys and weakens the authority of the Scripture in the hearts and minds of God's people. Wherever it goes, a pastor who left the Southern Baptist Convention in 1996, a second-generation Southern Baptist pastor, and on my mailing list, he wrote to me and said, the problem with the Southern Baptists is, not that, is that they have no absolute authority. Although, while I was still in the Southern Baptist Convention, we claimed to have settled the matter of the inerrancy of Scripture in 1986, we did not settle what Scripture is or where it is. The typical Southern Baptist church, or put any evangelical denomination in there, has no less than four different translations in any given service. So it is impossible for the people to hear, thus saith the Lord. Every issue becomes debatable. Every conviction becomes questionable. Indeed it does. Well, my Bible doesn't say that, Pastor. And so the smorgasbord of modern versions, very, 
very serious problem, error, Christian rock mu music. If you go over to the music department, I did. I went over to the music department at the Lifeway Bookstore at Southeastern Baptist Seminary on this trip. And I said, you have a music section? He said, yeah, it's here. So we walked over there. And I said, where's your sacred music section? Guess what? They didn't have a sacred music section, but they had a big rock music section. And Christian rock music is the illegitimate merging of Christ with the world. Now, here's a history of Christian rock, and it's titled Raised by Wolves. You show me a time in history where wolves have raised sheep. <laughs> Unless they want to grow them up to be more tender. You know, whatever. Wolves don't raise sheep. That's stupid. <laughs> but that's, that's how crazy, that's how insane Christian rock is. And they even recognize this. The Bible plainly says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father but is of the world. That condemns a huge percentage of, of teenagers in independent Baptist churches right there and proves they don't love the Father because they are in love with the world. And some of you are sitting right here tonight. The love of the Father is not in him. Very powerful, plain uh, statements from the Word of God. And contemporary Christian music is a slippery slope to the world. It puts people into communication with, with the world, with the secular rock and all of its dangers. These Christian rockers, they don't love hymns. They don't even love Christian rock. They love secular rock, the real thing. Cadman's Call, and I could give a couple hundred quotes like this tonight. Cabman's called greatest love in music is secular rock. The greatest love in music. Jars of Clay, the lead guitarist, is a Beatles fanatic. They get so crazy with this. They get so confused with this. They, everything gets so mixed up in their life. The, uh, uh, the secular takes them over so much that they end up performing a secular rock and roll in the churches. And that, this goes on all the time, worshiping to, to rock. Uh, uh, ACDC, Easter Sunday, 2009, New Spring Church, Anderson, South Carolina, performed Highway to Hell. This Easter, Northport Church, Springfield, Missouri, big emerging churches, they performed Sympathy, Sympathy for the Devil. I don't know where we're going to go from there. They performed it full-blown, in costume, danced, choreographed, Sympathy for the devil. But rock music has always been about the devil, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Lords of Chaos, one of the histories of rock music. Rock music has always held the seeds of the forbidden, and it's always captured the hearts and always made rebels out of people. What, what, what could make students of a fundamental Baptist college curse at a grandfather preacher? Rock music. Show me a rebellious teenager. I'll show you someone that's, that's found some rock and roll somewhere in his life. I did. That's me. I was always good looking. That's me. Uh, full of the devil. Nearly possessed with the devil in those days. And uh, 1972, I think that was. And that rock and roll reached into that church, Baptist church that I was in, into the home that I was in. And, uh, and captured my heart and soul. S surveys show that a huge percentage of young of children that grow up in, in, uh, in, in Bible-believing churches end up out in the world by adolescence. They're gone. Huge percentage. Overall statistics. And rock and roll has a big part in that. Christian rock. That's, that's not possible. That's insanity. That's an end-time fable. Cultural liberalism, which goes hand-in-hand hand with this. The emerging church, these, these emerging evangelicals today, they, they call themselves culturally liberal. Some of them want to be theologically conservative. They're Reformed Calvinist, uh, almost invariably. Mark Driscoll in Seattle, he said, I'm a theologically conservative and culturally liberal. Culturally liberal indeed. 
And uh, they have champagne dance parties at New Year's. You've got to bring your ID to see if you can drink. You know how old you are to beer brewing lessons for the men. That'll pick up the membership right there. The men watch and discuss R-rated movies. They operate a secular rock and roll theater. And uh, we could go on and on about how culturally liberal they are. That's the biggest church, one of the biggest churches in America and the biggest church in Seattle, Washington. And this cultural liberalism, Donald Miller talks about how he wanted to drink beer and watch raunchy movies and talk trashy and run around with atheists and rebels when he was growing up in church. And now he's free to do that in the emerging church. Everything's okay. David Foster and a slew and slews of books promoting this cultural liberalism. David Foster promotes a renegade's guide to God. He said we won't be told what to do or commanded how to behave. Uh, the Barbarian Way, Erwin McManus. And these are the conservatives of that movement, by the way. Those in the Barbarian Way do not focus on requirements, are not required to keep in step, and there is no forced conformity. Sounds like a re rebel to me. And they love rock and roll. That's, in the, that's a huge part of the cult cultural liberalism that I can keep my music. Uh, Rick Warren, you go to his church, and there's nine worship venues to choose from. Whatever suits your fancy. I don't know if they have an old hymns venue or not, but that doesn't suit any of their fancy anyway. But, but anything else you can find there on Sunday morning. They have the overdrive venue for those who like the guitar-driven rock band worship. And the Ohana venue, and you can learn the hula there. And the country venue, and you can learn line dancing there. That's my favorite one. <laughs> Darren Patrick, the journey in St. Louis. I'm kidding. I have to say that. Some people don't get it. The Journey in St. Louis, Southern Baptist pastor. And he has the theology at the Bottle Works. And they go to this bar and they, uh, and, they, and they advertise it. Grab a brew and give your view. Cultural liberalism. It's an end time fable. Ecumenicalism. They all hold these philosophies. Billy Graham led the way in this. He broke down the walls of separation between uh, all the denominations, turned thousands of his converts back over to Roman Catholic churches. Franklin is following in his footsteps. Franklin, who now is uh, head of that ministry. And in 1999, Franklin said that the ecumenical alliance with the Catholic Church and other denominations, quote, was one of the smartest things his father ever did. C.S. Lewis is one of the most revered figures in the uh, contemporary Christianity today. And he promoted this ecumenical idea. His book, Mere Christianity, which is hugely popular, uh, 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 pre presents a Christianity that consists of all the denominations, a big house with many rooms. And you've got the Catholic room and the Presbyterian room and the Lutheran room, Episcopalian room and, and the Baptist room and all that. And there's lots of Baptist rooms. And, and so you've got this big house, and, and, it, and it's all good, but we need to find our place within the big house, the ecumenical philosophy. Charles Colson said the body of Christ in all its diversity is created with Baptist feet, charismatic hands, Catholic ears. The, the ecumenical philosophy, Mark, Max Lucado, my faith has been supplemented by people of other groups, Pentecostal, Anglican, Southern Baptist, Presbyterian, Catholic, uh, they've all uh, fortified me, edified me, built up my Christian life. Elizabeth Elliot, whose uh, husband was killed by the Malka Indians in South America, and, uh, but she's radically ecumenical. When her brother became a, uh, a Roman Catholic some years back, she was interviewed about that, asked questions about that in, in Wisconsin. And uh, someone said, can a person be Catholic and Christian? She said, yes, we can have unity and diversity. My brother Thomas is a Catholic and a Christian. The question came, then is it acceptable to celebrate the Catholic Mass? And she said, yes. 
Richard Foster, one of the most influential names in Christianity in this day. And he says, I see a Catholic monk from the hills of Kentucky standing alongside a Baptist evangelist from the streets of Los Angeles and together offering up a sacrifice of praise, the ecumenical philosophy. Anybody get together, any old gospel, any old doctrine's okay, and that's a damnable heresy. The charismatic movement is there, permeating, permeating through everything today, the fastest growing part of Christianity, they say. And uh, it has permeated evangelicalism. Prior to the 1970s, evangelicals were opposed to the uh, Pentecostal movement. For example, Arno Gabeline said, We are now convinced that this movement is not of God. 1907, he was right. But by the 1970s, dramatic changes had happened, not within Pentecostalism. In fact, Pentecostalism had become crazier than ever and had become the charismatic movement and uh, flopping on the floor, foaming at the mouth and uh, the Roman Catholics and everything. But J.I. Packer said, the charismatic movement must be adjudged the work of God. Sharing charismatic experience unifies Protestants and Roman Catholics at a deeper level than that at which their doctrine divides. Jack Hayford, he, he's called the biblical Pentecostal. The Christianity today called him the gold standard of Pentecostalism because he's supposedly so solidly biblical. Let me show you how biblical he is. This picture was taken in 2000 in St. Louis at a charismatic conference where I heard him speak. And he told how his daughter came to him and said, Dad, I don't think my tongue's are scriptural because they don't sound like anything. Now, that was good sense right there. But he said, well, you've got to learn to speak in baby tongues before you learn to speak in real tongues. Now, that's stupid. That's not only stupid, it's heresy. You cannot learn how to do a miracle. There were no classes before Pentecost. Well, we've got to get ready for this, Peter. It's either a miracle or it's not. And that's one of the greatest miracles in the Bible. To be able to speak fluently, just immediately speak fluently a language which you have never heard or learned is an incredible miracle. And the accompanying miracle was interpretation of a language that you've never learned. A mighty miracle. You can't learn a miracle, folks. If you can learn it, it's not a miracle. Spirit slaying, uh, flopping around on the floor, and, uh, and uh, that's not a miracle. I've, all my grandkids are little, six years old and under, and they fall down. <laughs> Holy laughter and spirit drunkenness. It just has gotten wilder and crazier every decade in the charismatic movement. Rodney Howard Brown running around calling himself the Holy Ghost bartender, and they get drunk and stagger around and fall down and such. Run their cars, have, have crashes. Experience orientation. They say they're Bible-based, but really it's all about experience. And uh, Anaheim Vineyard, John Wimber's church, 1994. In a moment, I'm going to call down the Spirit. Above all, don't try to rationally evaluate the things you will see. An experience orientation. The word faith heresy, and we could go on and on. The charismatic movement is very dangerous. In time, fables. Self-esteemism permeated evangelical Christianity. Robert Schuller was one of the kings of this, and he uh, and he's, uh, reinterpreted everything in the Bible in, in terms of this self-esteem. To be born again is to be changed from a negative to a positive self-image. And sin is the lack of self-esteem, and, and, uh, and on and on he goes. James Dobson has been a great promoter of this, self-esteemism. He says that lack of self-esteem is a threat to the entire human family. Indeed, I thought it was sin. And uh, slews and slews of these psychology teachers promoting the self-esteemism, which is an end-time fable. And the Bible doesn't talk much about building up our self-esteem, but it talks a lot about dying to self. And our problem really is when we're lost, we have way too much self-esteem. Downgrade in Bible inspiration. The modernism and the liberal thinking about the Bible 
And it quickly permeated, began to permeate the new evangelical movement. Within just a decade, men were doubting the Bible and doubting its uh, full divine inspiration. You've got men like Bruce Metzger who they call, uh, they call they, an evangelical. He's dead now. But they, but, uh, and he's spoken at Tennessee Temple. And he's the editor of the United Bible Society's Greek New Testament, which is used by almost everybody. But he says the Pentateuch is a matrix of myth, legend, and history. Noah's flood was local. Job is an ancient folk tale. Isaiah was written by three men. Jonah is a popular legend. Those are all lies, by the way. C.S. Lewis, Jonah and Job are grotesque tales. Brian McLaren, it's wrong and pharisaical to look upon the Bible as God's encyclopedia, God's rule book, and God's answer book. Brennan Manning, I develop a nasty rash around people who speak as if mere scrutiny of the Bible's pages will reveal precisely how God thinks and what God wants. Wouldn't he get a nasty rash around here? <laughs> Poor thing. We'd have to get him some ointment. <laughs> process, salvation. The salvation is a process. Jesus said it was a birth. They don't believe that. Dallas Willard, why is it? He's spoken at Tennessee Temple where I went to school. Why is it that we look upon salvation as a moment that began our religious life instead of the daily life we receive from God? Well, why is it, Dallas? Isn't it just because we believe the Bible and we don't get rashes about it? Tony Campolo, my mother hoped I would not have one of those dramatic born-again experiences, but it never worked for me. In my case, intimacy with Christ was developed gradually over the years. By the way, I got to interview him a few years ago at a Baptist conference. It was a Baptist conference led by three Baptist giants, uh, Bill Clinton, Jimmy Carter, and Al Gore. And, and uh, Tony was there. <laughs> And he turned, he's a chameleon, he turned into a fundamentalist during that conference. Anyway, he doesn't believe the Bible. He's never been born again by his own testimony. Jesus said salvation is a birth. And uh, every, every salvation we see in the book of Acts, in the Bible, we see the dramatic conversion. I hope you've experienced that. Contemplative mysticism sweeping through the evangelicalism today. Incredibly dangerous thing. Incredibly dangerous. It is an attempt to commune with God experimentally. And you can see how this fits in with the charismatic philosophy. It's all about experience. And uh, 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 not just uh, by faith believing the Bible and, and, and by faith communing with God through the scripture, and, and, but, it, but an experience and a direct revelation even. And the means to that are the Roman Catholic practices that they've dug out of the old monastic uh, system of Rome. And this thing is drawing the evangelicals closer and closer to Rome, uh, as is the Christian rock and many other things. And it's drawing at the same time Rome uh, closer to these pagan, pagan religions like Hinduism and Buddhism and even new age and it's all bringing everybody together does that ring a bell to anybody who knows anything about prophecy centering prayer is one of the uh, uh practices and involves emptying the mind of, of a thought through a mantra you choose a word and you use that word and repeat that word and you drive out your thoughts and you go down inside of yourself and you can meet god down inside of yourself in your being the visualization prayer uh, which came from Loyola, one of the founders of the Jesuits, trying to put yourself into a Bible scene through your imagination, like going into the manger and talking to baby Jesus. What is that? That's stupid. Jesus' prayer consists of repeating the phrase, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me over and over and over and over again. As if Jesus, God's hard of hearing. Imagine if you would try talk to your wife like that. <laughs> she would hit you upside the head. I hope. Richard Foster, one of the most influential names in Christianity and spreading this contemplative mysticism everywhere, recommending men like Thomas Merton, 
who was a Catholic priest and a Buddhist monk. He was a priest stationed at a monastery in Kentucky where they don't talk, you know, silence. I, I went there one time uh, to visit it after he died. But he was also a Buddhist, and he worshipped Buddha. He went to Sri Lanka and worshipped the Buddha shrines there on the coast. And he said, I don't know when in my life I've ever had such a sense of beauty and vitality worshiping those very Buddhas. Christian bookstores stocking a wide variety of these old Catholic mystics who were laden down with heresies. The lessons of St. Francis and uh, Teresa of Avila. And uh, laden down with heresies, baptismal regeneration and uh, uh, reverence for the Pope and veneration for Mary and purgatory and all of these things. You say, who in the world would be promoting this? Just about everybody. Rick Warren is promoting it big time. Bill Hybels uh, uh, there in Chicago. Willow Creek. Chuck Swindoll. David Jeremiah. Beth Moore. Max Lucado. Charles Stanley. These are supposed to be the conservative evangelicals. These are ones that independent, some independent Baptists are wanting to associate with now. Well, they're conservative. There's nothing conservative about these guys. Not biblically, not when judged by the Bible. Chuck Stanley. Many independent Baptists listen to him. Many. He said in his last magazine, October 2011, find a silent place. Do nothing. Now he's not talking about going to a quiet place, you know, with your Bible to, to, to meditate on the Bible and to pray. And that, that's not what these people are talking about. He says, go to the silent place and do nothing. But make yourself available to the Lord. That's, that's what they're teaching. Just sit there and do nothing and See what will happen. Simply invite him to meet you in the stillness and speak to you. Sense his presence. How, how can I? How can I know it's his presence? The, the, the devil's the god of this world. He appears as an angel of light. I'm sure he can give me some tinglies. He did before I was saved. And uh, experience it. That is a recipe for spiritual disaster. How do you know who's talking to you in that? You'll probably go to sleep anyway. But if you don't, if you really get into it and get good at it, how do you know what's happening? Unless you take this book, and, the, and this book is right there, and you're just testing everything, including your feelings by the book and your experiences, how do you know who's talking to you, who's doing that stuff to you? Uh, get out of here with that stuff. Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary, the devil, walketh around seeking whom he may devour. Be careful. This is really, really, really dangerous stuff. I'm going to show you how dangerous. Salvation apart from faith in Christ. Another fable. Billy Graham led the way in this. 1978, and since then also, he said, I used to believe that pagans in far-off countries were lost, were going to hell. If they did not have the gospel preached to them, I no longer believe that. Max Cato, in one of his newest books, Max on Life. The question is asked, what about the people who have never heard of God? Will God punish them? He said, no, he will not. Heaven's population includes throngs of people who learned the name of their Savior when they awoke in their eternal home. It's kind of woke up in heaven. That's very popular now. Well, it's a lie. And all those missionaries that have suffered so much for Christ the last 2,000 years didn't believe that. I don't believe that. Yeah. Nepal's not my chosen place to live. If I want a chosen place to live, I'm 61 years old. If I want a chosen place to live, if I live another 10 years, say, or whatever, and have some health, I'll go to Virginia Beach. I've got it planned. I'd go to Virginia Beach, told my son, uh, I'll buy a boat. I love boats. love water. Lots of water in Virginia Beach. Pretty good climate. Not much wind. <laughs> you know, I got blown away today. I didn't know if I was going to get to the car. Trying to get from the motel to the car. 
And uh, no, not a lot of wind. Beautiful place. I'm not going there. I have no plans to go there. I want to be in Nepal. And, and there's spiritual fruit there. I want to have some spiritual fruit. In my old age. And, uh, but it's because I know that if they don't put their faith in Jesus Christ consciously, that they will be lost and go to hell. My wife and I know that. C.S. Lewis, and what are we talking about? Theistic evolution. Permeating evangelicalism. And C.S. Lewis, again, was one of the main men in promoting this. He said that man began as an animal that may have existed for ages in this state before it became man. God calls to descend upon this organism a new kind of consciousness. So there was an ape, some kind of ape thing, and then God just, he, be, he woke up and he was a man the next morning. And the thing, same thing happened to the female ape. <laughs> and, it, and here we are. Billy Graham thinks that might be possible. He said in 1966, either at a certain moment in evolution, God breathed into one particular ape man who was Adam. I wonder if the ape man knew he was Adam. <laughs> or God could have taken a handful of dust and created a man just like that. Okay, well, I wonder which one it was. Could have, could have. No, we know what happened. There's no could have. There's no possibility that, that Adam was an ape. It's not a possibility. But this is permeated. Permeated evangelicalism. Uh, uh, Ken Ham's new book, Already Compromised, about the evangelical schools and how this has permeated uh, uh, them. Eastern Nazareth College, um, Fuller Theological Seminary, Calvin College, Southwestern Baptist Seminary. William Densky believes the C.S. Lewis story. He said Adam and Eve were possibly human-like beings from outside the garden. And uh, God transformed their consciousness. Afterwards, they experienced an amnesia of their former animal life. So that's why we can't remember that. <laughs> you know, and you know what that is. That is heresy. That's wretched, horrible terrible, horrible heresy. Jesus taught us all about the early chapters of Genesis and taught us very plainly that it's all historical truth. His genealogy is traced from Adam, not some monkey. Genesis is the foundation for the gospel. If there's no literal Adam and Eve and no literal uh, fall, there's no literal gospel. The gospel is silly if, if all of that's not literal. Wretched, horrible heresy to downgrade in hell is another fable. Permeated evangelicalism. C.S. Lewis broke the ground for this, saying hell is a state of mind. Billy Graham also followed suit. I think hell essentially is a separation from God forever. I think the fire that is mentioned in the Bible is a burning thirst for God that can never be quenched. Rod Bell God gives us what we want, and if that's hell, we can have it. There are individual hells and communal, society-wide hells. But Jesus settled the hell question a long time ago. And he said, if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. That's the final word on hell. Christian homosexuality permeating evangelicalism. Christian. Third generation Baptist pastor says churches are not called to be moral police. We should approach homosexuals without condemnation. No, we should approach them with compassion with the gospel and explain to them that they are like everyone else, sinners, and that they have to repent of sin. And uh, Dan Kimball, we can no longer just regurgitate what we have been taught about homosexuality. Philip Yancey, when it gets to particular matters of policy like ordaining gay and lesbian ministers, I'm confused like a lot of people. Brendan Manning, homophobia is among the most serious and vexing moral issues of this generation. Homophobia is the most serious problem. Permeating evangelicalism, 
false gods and goddesses. Not only heresies, but false gods and idols. The shack, when this came on the scene about three years ago, I realized how, how desperate the times are. When this began to resonate among evangelicals and Southern Baptists, William Paul Young wrote it. It's a story. He depicts God as, as uh, God the Father is depicted as a, a, a black woman who loves rock and roll and uh, is a good cook and also an older gray-haired man with the ponytail. Depicts the Holy Spirit as a young woman. The shack God is very cool, non-judgmental, doesn't exercise wrath towards sin, doesn't send anybody to hell, puts no obligations on people. The shack God says, I don't punish sin. The shack God says, the Bible doesn't teach you to follow rules. The shack God said, those who love me come from every system that exists, Buddhists, Mormons, Muslims, I'd have no desire to make them Christian. No desire. And this is sweeping, and, uh, uh, sweeping through evangelicalism. The Emerging Church Conference that I attended with press credentials about three years ago, uh, they acclaimed this book. They interviewed the author, the editor of Christianity Today, interviewed the author, and they were laughing together, and there's just no problem at all. I read about one woman who read this, and uh, she came to her mother, after reading it, and she said, is it all right if I divorce the old God and marry the new one? Well, that's what North America's doing now. Right before our eyes. And the churches. It's very popular with Southern Baptists. False gods. Rob Bell, the God who sends people to burning hell is terrifying and traumatizing and unbearable. God is a force, an energy. Brennan Manning, the God who exacts the last drop of blood from his son so that his just anger evoked by sin may be appeased is not God. Dallas Willard, it's wrong to see God as a policeman on the prowl. He says, God will not destroy the earth in a rage. Well, not an uncontrollable rage because God's always in control, but he will. By Second Peter says he will destroy this world by fire because of his wrath at sin. These men worship a false God. That's how far things have come. This contemplative mysticism puts people into communication with a God that is like, more like Hinduism than anything in the Bible. John Michael, Michael Talbot, one of the big names in contemporary Christian music, who practices this contemplative mysticism, he's a Roman Catholic. God is the ultimate reality he's come to believe. Sue Monk Kidd, who was Southern Baptist Sunday school teacher, she got uh, depressed. She got uh, discouraged in her life. And one of her Sunday school co-workers recommended, I think, the book by Richard Foster, Contemplative Mysticism. She began to try to practice that. She began to go to Catholic retreats and sit in the silence. And, uh, and now she's a goddess. She thinks she's a goddess. The divine feminine presence in herself. Henry Nguyen, these are all contemplative, big names in the contemplative movement. It says, our souls are those sacred sinners where all is one. Philip Johnson, God is the core of my being and the core of all things. Wayne Teasdale, you are God, I am God, they are God, it is God. There, pure Hinduism. How did he get there? Contemplative mysticism. Contemplative prayer. The same stuff you'll find throughout evangelicalism today. You see, all these people are holding hands because they don't believe in separation. And, though, and those enticing, that enticing country out there with all of its so -called supposed liberties and all the enticements, it's very dangerous. And once you break down the separation between a real Bible-believing church and that broader world out there, Christian world out there, there's no telling where people will go or where they will end up. I'm very concerned about my children and my grandchildren. All of my children, uh, by God's grace, are serving the Lord, but my grandchildren, where are they going to go to church in 15 years? Will there be a strong church in Winkler in 15 years? 
that still believes in separation. These things don't happen overnight, but they happen gradually. Just give up that and give up that and give up that and here we go. Separation is so important. So very important. We look back with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. It's an issue of protection, spiritual protection. Separation is a fundamental issue in the Bible. And tomorrow night, we're going to look at this passage more closely and look at exactly what the Bible is saying about separation, how to practice it. But the reason for the separation is protection. Look at verses 16 through 18. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. For they will increase unto more ungodliness. There's an influence that will come. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Say that after me, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupts good manners. That's a short verse, but it has such far-reaching implications. Be not deceived. But we are being deceived. So many are. It's so easy to be deceived. There's so many enticements. And their word will eat as doth a canker of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus who concerning the truth have erred saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. The separation is a matter of spiritual protection because God loves us. That young person, that student I quoted this morning, and they said, uh, you, you preach against rock music because you don't, you've never learned to love anyone. Well, my friends, it's just the opposite. Parents that love their children discipline their children maybe even spank their children because they love them. We're not talking about abuse, but a, a, a proper discipline because they love them, because they see the future and the kids don't, and they want to protect them from things. And that's exactly why a preacher warns about error. I think many don't because they're blind. They've never even been born again. So they don't see these things. They don't understand any, these things. Why should they warn? But the Bible-believing preacher that sees these things, the Bible's so amazing, we can see the future through here. What an amazing book and a Bible-believing preacher that sees these things and knows these things and knows what happens when people flirt around with these things. He would, he, he would not have any love at all if he refused to warn his people plainly about dangers. He would be an incompassionate man if he held back those things that he knows God's people need. That would be a gross lack of Christian compassion. It's just the opposite. Who has the love? A shepherd that loves the sheep will protect them from wolves. He won't stand there and say, you know, I have a suggestion, sheep. <laughs> and give some little positive message. He will, he will run out there. He'll warn. He'll do what is necessary to drive those wolves out of your life because he loves the sheep. And it's just the opposite. You see so, some blind men w walking toward a cliff. You know, the blind leading the blind, they all fall into the ditch. And you see those blind, that's what I think of these evangelicals, they're blind. And you see the blind walking and they're all heading toward the cliff and they're roped together and they're going along and they have the hand on the shoulder following the blind leader and they're headed toward a cliff. What would you do if you loved them? Would you go stand over there and, and in, in positive tones say, I have a suggestion. <laughs> You know, there might be another path over here you'd want to go to. No, you'd, you'd do what you could to keep them from falling over the cliff. Warn them. 
Serious stuff. Serious stuff. We sang some great songs tonight that made me, I'm not a big shouter, but almost made me want to shout a couple times. And, and glorious truths about the love of Christ and, the, and the all we have in him and all those wonderful things. Well, that's not exactly what we're doing here. But what we're doing here in this conference is trying to protect God's people from spiritual dangers. Pastor, would you come?